Hello everyone, here I am with another review three years too late. I know it might not make a whole lot of sense to you, but now that I have my very own channel, as I play older titles and check what reviewers said about them at the time of release, I just get a niche to chip in when I feel like the general opinion doesn't match my own. And yeah, just like with Life is Strange True Colors before, I don't get where people were coming from with the almost universal praise for this one, because it is kind of a mixed bag. I mean, to be fair, as soon as I fired up Immortals Phoenix Rising, I instantly got what people were saying. Hey, this has a cheeky, snarky tone, an art direction that's fun, and the whole thing doesn't take itself too seriously. The protagonist, for instance, is dubbed to sound like a bad actor overacting in a school play. The priest of Apollo? Oh, hey, you. What are you doing here? Oh, you know, prophecies, <laughs> prophesies. <laughs> Which is inventive. This could really work. All right, yeah, you go, Ubisoft. I believe in you. Go. And then, 15 minutes in, the game asked me to climb a statue. Okay, let's see what's up there, I naively thought. Oh, it wants me to check something on the horizon. A marker. Another one. And a no oh god damn it Ubisoft. What can I say about Immortals Phoenix Rising? The rug pull in those first 15 minutes, in which it seemed like I might be in for a fun silly time, only for it to be revealed that the game was, in fact, just another cookie cutter open world, was really disheartening. That is the biggest twist in the whole story, by the way. It feels like one of those old Scooby-Doo episodes with the monster review. Oh my, the monster was actually old man Yubi all along. I don't want to be too harsh on Immortal Phoenix Rising, though, because in the end, it at least tries. If we make a Venn diagram with all major Ubisoft franchises as of late, we might end up with pretty much one big circle. Immortals Phoenix Rising, on the other hand, feels like it is a little more outside the box as UB open world games go. Immortals Phoenix... Okay, I just dropped this stupid name and called the game Gods and Monsters, like God intended before Monster Energy Drink dropped by Ubisoft with a cease and desist letter because it apparently owns the word monster or something. I still haven't gotten over that one. How did anyone sign off on this? How is it okay? Anyway, back to Gods and Monsters. There are like eight different in-game currencies. Why? Who thought this was a good idea that anyone would enjoy? There's the yellow crystal, the blue one, the red one, the pride parade one, and then they run out of colors and reuse yellow with an ember gem. Why is any of this here? Oh, to fuel the in-game store, of course. Gotta keep those microtransaction coins coming, I guess. At least this one has a bigger focus on puzzles and platforming, which, indeed, makes it stand out from Ubisoft's other output. It's a pity these are not well integrated into the open world, though. Most puzzles happen in these vaults, which are in an alternative reality because they were most likely put together by completely different developers from the rest of the game, and who probably live in an entirely different in continent. Most of these vaults are reasonable, I mean the optional ones, because some of the main story ones are exhausting. No, really. They go on and on and on and it feels like you've been there forever. And because of that you start noticing stuff that hinders your enjoyment of the game. Like, you can climb absolutely anything in the open world, but as soon as you step into a vault you can barely double jump. What the fuck? The lack of puzzle variety will get on your nerves as you reach the endgame as well. Push a box here, fondle some balls over there, shoot an arrow or another. By the end of it, I was pretty much over it. At least Gods and Monsters let you figure out its puzzles without much interference, unlike, say, Lara Croft in the recent Tomb Raider trilogy or Aloy in the Horizon games. Those two get really antsy if you take longer than 30 seconds to figure something out, and you'll start spewing unwanted tips like they're fucking clippy. Phoenix, however, doesn't. Good. This is a positive for the character, which is nice because there aren't many others. Don't get me wrong, there aren't many negatives either. Phoenix isn't developed well enough for you to feel a type of way about the character. Their character arc feels more like a character speed bump. 
because it barely registers. And that's weird because this thing has a character creator, which is normally an indicator that we are not in for a completely fixed story and we have some kind of agency somewhere. Maybe some fluff dialogue options or a choice that matters in the end. But no, you have no say in anything. You can just pick out if your character will be male or female, blue or green. I mean, fine. What else? What else? Oh, there are mounts in Gods and Monsters, which is something I never understood the point of in this kind of game. Mounts are there to make things easier and help you get around quicker. However, you can't walk for 10 seconds in any direction without having to dismount to deal with open world junk. And it is junk. The open world is absolutely empty, there is no incentive to explore it. No NPCs or side quests not given by the gods, just more vaults, pomegranates and bullshit. In fact, I used to like pomegranates, not so much now. Old me would have given up on mounts at that point so that I could do all this busy work, but new me is working hard on self-control and self-respect. I will respect my time. I won't leave the critical path to play some harp thing. No Ubisoft. I have noticed that this review so far has been largely focused on the game's systems and open world without really mentioning anything in the story apart from Phoenix. But to be honest, what is there to say about it? It's a fairly standard isekai thing with not a whole lot of character development or twists in the story. Everything is pretty straightforward, which for something going for a more comical tone is not really an issue. I will say, the narrative framing with Zeus and Prometheus bickering over events was a highlight for me, especially that one bit about Aphrodite's birth. In fact, the gods are great overall, their interactions ooze mundane drama, like we are watching real Housewives of Olympus or something. It's fun, really. I wish we had more of that, maybe more gods to save in smaller worlds instead of the few big areas there are. And that really gets you thinking, what is going on at Ubisoft. This game did not need an expensive open world with 5,000 collectible currencies. Its narrative is structured like a PS2 era game with clear defined worlds that are independent from each other. Kingdom Hearts came to mind for some reason. So why restrict the fun to the trappings of an open world? To be honest, I hope it was a mandatory thing from evil corporate higher-ups in order to sell those microtransactions so I can feel bad for the devs. Because if this was a genuine creative decision, then, well, I guess I feel even worse for the devs. Really, this was a missed opportunity to bring some good buzz for Yubi. I feel like they really need it, because this strategy of putting bullshit systems in place to maximize microtransactions is slowly bringing down the interest people once had for their IPs and their credibility as a reliable publisher. They really need to put quality first in some of their titles so that they can balance things out. Not everything can or needs to be a cash cow. Gods and Monsters could have been this neat little treat a palate cleanser after the open world one-two punch of Watch Dogs Legion and AC Valhalla. But nope, unfortunately it was more of the same. In the end, I guess I recommend Gods and Monsters, especially if you find it on sale or for free on some streaming service. But yeah, if I had paid full price on this, this review would probably ended up much more negative than it did. Yay for being late, I guess. And that's it for Gods and Monsters. It's a fun and forgettable experience if you have the willpower to ignore all the bullshit and drop the difficulty as soon as it seems like you have to grind to keep the fun going. I better stop saying the word monster right now because- Oh god, it's here! No! Thank you for making to the end of another video. You're a trooper for tolerating the subpar editing and my really annoying voice. Go and grab yourself a cookie, you've earned it. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to my channel and click on the notification button. Also, don't forget to tell me what you thought of Immortal Phoenix Rising in the comments below. Do you agree with my take on the game? Do you think any of its DLC are worth it? Should I check them out? Let me know. Oh. I haven't mentioned Breath of the Wild anywhere in this video. Do you think you would have had this much self-control? I don't think so.